Hi, Rihanna. Hope everyone's comfortable. Hope you all have or have something to eat with you and that you're all comfortable. Uh, Hi, Louisa. Hey, Ruby. I can't see myself. I can see you. Okay. I can That's see good you. enough for me. Ikaw lang mag-isa dyan from my view. Ako rin. It, I can't access oh. the gallery view. Oh, okay. Maybe, maybe. Gallery view. Hi, Rihanna. There you go. Hello, Ramon. How are you? Alive. But <laughs> the sun is well? Uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, wonderful. Oh, wonderful. It's coming out right, yeah. Oh, wonderful. Hello, Ramon. I'm so glad to see you again. I'm Alex. Buenas noches, amiga. Buenas, buenos dias para mí. Ah, sí, <laughs> sí, sí, claro. ¿Cómo estás? Muy buen. Me alegra, me alegra mucho. That's all my Spanish for tonight. <laughs> Cheers, everyone. Cheers. Cheers. Oh, what's that? Is that aguardiente? No, that's just a little bit of honey for my voice. <laughs> <laughs> you cheater. <laughs> With a little bit of rum inside the uh, honey, I didn't like, specify. Okay. Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Hello to the mother. <laughs> and so you've just seen a demonstration of the wonderful warmth and humor that went into the making of this book between Ramon Sunico and Alexandra Walter. I'm Padma Perez. I'm the editor for Asia and lead strategist for Agam Agenda. And um, with us this evening is my colleague, Maria Faciolince. Wave, Maria, say hi. And she has very kindly um, agreed to do simultaneous interpretation in Spanish for us this evening. So she is going to drop directions in the chat box so you can see um, how to join the Spanish speaking channel to hear the translation. Wow. There we go. Thank you so much, Maria. And for everyone, Maria is also a photographer, a contributing photographer. She has two photographs um, in the book, Harvest Moon. Um, and since then, she's kept in touch with us and she's become a colleague and is working with us now. Um, and she's helping us run the campaign, poetry campaign called When Is Now? And you'll hear more about this a little later. So Maria, are we good? Have people joined you in the Spanish channel? And we can continue? Okay, wonderful. Thank you, dear. Hello, everyone. So, well, here we go. Welcome to the creator's launch of the of Harvest Moon, poems and stories from the edge of the climate crisis. Gathered here in this moment are incredible writers, photographers, editors, colleagues, dear friends, co-conspirators, and communi community members who have supported this book along its journey. And wow, what a journey it's been. We have an amazing array of people gathering here tonight. So if your bandwidth allows, please turn your cameras on. And I can see most of you have your cameras on. Thank you so much. Um, I suggest you select gallery view so you can see as many smiles as will fit on your screen. Um, and we can be present with each other in this way. Thank you everyone for turning your cameras on. 
it's for some of us we are seeing each other for the first time ever after many exchanges of emails um, and letters and for most of us this is our very first time to meet and we're grateful and thrilled that you could all be here now I'm sure my dear friend Red Constantino shares this feeling and he's brimming with excitement Red is the executive director of the Institute for Climate and Sustainable Cities. He has worked for close to three decades, maybe more, with international climate development and environment campaigning organizations spanning South, Southeast, East, and Central Asia, and all the other corners and nooks and crannies of the world. I like to think, Red, that this is, it's your commitment to this work coupled with your creative and mischievous spirit that led you to become the instigator of all this. Red, we'd love to hear from you. Thank you, Padma. Um, I am actually more excited to hear from everyone. So um, uh, with your permission, uh, I'd like to um, share a few remarks uh, so we can get this uh, event going. Um, Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I extend a profound embrace to everyone who found time to join this event. We are all going through different difficulties at the moment. So I thought before I thank anyone, I must first attempt to frame our collective effort Instead of the urgency of science, politics, or poetics, I choose to offer only what is deeply personal, given the deeply personal struggle many of us have been in for some time. I believe in many things, but what feels elevated to me at the moment is something singular. We are driven by a sense of purpose many can relate to, but which few can fathom. I believe the only mystery truly worthy of faith is the elusive answer to the simplest yet most profound question most people today seem to no longer bother to ask themselves. How is it possible that one can love a boy or a girl, a companion, a patch of land, or a fabric of sky, or a vision of a far future many are trying to live today so deeply and with so much of one's being that every waking minute of a day, anywhere one looks or listens, everything that one smells or tastes or feels, or hears, or sees, is a reminder of the things that give us gravity, buoyancy, and meaning. It should not be possible, but it is. And we are all the richer. Each day it remains a mystery, even if it undergoes a hundred thousand distillations daily because it is ultimately an unanswerable question we will continue to pursue but never reach. And yet it is the reason we act. It is the reason we write. It is the reason why we capture images. I would like to th also think that both question and elusive answer are the reason why many of us in this event, whenever faced with colossal odds completely stacked against us, will never hesitate to embrace the intangible over the pragmatic compromise. Even if we face the protracted pits of starless nights and isolation, because we know somehow against all logic that life will remain ultimately unruly and subversive and thus beautiful. 
Humanity certainties defined largely by wealthy white men are the reason why we are today in this deep and frightening mess called the climate crisis. And yet we rise, and yet we rise. We even get to make a book together. For as we confront the cumulative depravities of ignorance, misogyny, and avarice, we also get to retain and nourish the ability to hope. We hope and remind ourselves that the injustices that take our breath away also gives us oxygen. Just as blazing sunsets across our crisis-plagued world pierces our senses when given overcast skies. We hope, colleagues, we hope. And we write, we capture images, we paint, draw, we march and shout and fight. We act, in other words, and thus we hope. To do so is a reminder to ourselves that it is an act of love because love is rescue and refuge. Love is longing and pain. Love generates great and searing anger and love calms the strongest of storms. It is love that gives laughter the gift of flight. Yet love is also a spectacularly frightening thing because it defines absence or presence in ways completely outside our control. Love is atmospheric heights and love is roots sunk deep. Love is what has helped all of you produce hope and this book and the possibility of a gentler, happier, safer future. Around a month ago, leaders from what today counts as 55 governments representing 1.4 billion people in the world agreed to advance a cultural campaign capable of harnessing the humanities in order to fully integrate climate science into policymaking while exhorting the public to get more involved. Our event today is one among many triggers. We are aimed at several launches in 2022 and the year after, because for sure we intend to be part of the Ubud Writers Festival in Indonesia when Indonesia takes on the G20 presidency next year. And without a doubt, and hoping we succeed, we might also be part of the 2023 Jaipur Literary Festival on the year India assumes the G20 presidency. And of course, it need not be said, looming even larger are the events we must and will pin down for Africa and Latin America. How bizarre are convictions, colleagues. What began as an idea in 2012, produced a pioneering book in 2014, and today we have a sequel that is composed of your constellations. Here in the book we launched today, we again marshal words against the machinery of indifference, violence, greed and war, which has brought the world we know on the brink of collapse. And we know our work will matter. We are unruly spores out to conquer the world with anger, joy, sharp strategies and love. But will we prevail? In almighty struggles, there are never any guarantees. Isn't that the reason though, why such struggles are called mighty? 
Through her novel, The Left Hand of Darkness, the writer Ursula K. Le Guin tells us again, in case we've forgotten, what we all need to dwell on today. Our imagination makes us human and it makes us fools. It gives us all the world and exiles us from it. Because the truth is, said Le Guin, the only thing that makes life possible is permanent, intolerable uncertainty, not knowing what comes next. And she's correct. It is uncertainty that we must embrace because it means the bad guys have not won yet. And we still have a world. We still have many worlds to win. My friends, the honor falls on me to thank all the contributors who made this night possible, to all the writers who shared their compelling, haunting, inspiring words. Thank you for the wings. To all the photographers who gave their sense of imagery to provoke and call forth narratives readers will soon encounter. Thank you for the winds. To all colleagues at the Institute for Climate and Sustainable Cities and our many partners in the campaigning world and the academe who, having moved so many pebbles, have ensured the editors were able to move mountains. To the gorgeous minds who continue to run the global climate poetry rebellion embodied in the When Is Now campaign, such as Maria, Carissa, and Anna, who have steadily introduced elements of the book we are launching today, particularly in bus stops and billboards in Glasgow at COP26, as they prepare to conquer 2022. To Felix, our book designer, for providing the extraordinary and just as important, restrained sense of aesthetic that has done justice to all the contributions. To my brothers, Tom Cruza and Ramon Sunico, who both not only believed, but also plucked so many stars from the firmaments they've generously shared to this enterprise. To the fierce and fabulous Rebecca Solnit, cartographer of dispossession and disobedience for providing the books afterward. She might no longer remember being asked by Tom and I in 2015 in Paris, and that she said yes six years ago, almost to this day. But Rebecca always keeps her word because she keeps the best words, the words that matter. To the mothers of this book, Rehana, Alexandra, and my beautiful sister, the lead editor Padma Pani, for giving birth to this book. As the writer Eduardo Galeano once reminded us, our task as individuals is to constantly find ways to justify the existence of our tiny blip in the universe. Today, we welcome the product of our collective enterprise, which now bears not only the title of Harvest Moon, poems and stories from the edge of the climate crisis, but also the physical feature of a book, which we hope can stand as a platform to the campaigns for accelerated change we need today. We need to wrest power from the tiny few intent on causing us harm today, if only to secure their narrow interests in the long run. We need the public to convince our governments to serve the interests of the intergenerational majority, to acquire more courage and to once and for all discard the hesitation advanced by the powerful and ignorant minority, willing tools, each one, 
paid and purchased by fossil capital and the dictatorship of accumulation and consumption. We will resist. We must resist. And we will win. But first, we must write. First, we must tell our stories. First, we must encourage others to tell their stories. And yes, before we write, we must read. We must sing and we must live. Thank you everyone and congratulations again to all of you. Every second counts and everyone matters. And so, Padma Pani Perez, back to you. Thank you, my dear brother, Red, and partner in mischief. Thank you so much for those words. So let's jump right into the thing that brings us all together tonight. It's my supreme pleasure to give everyone a first glimpse of the pages of Harvest Moon, so beautifully put together by Felix Mago Miguel, artist, designer, illustrator, and proud father living on the island of Bohol in the Philippines. Julia? Here we go. This is our cover page. Next, please. Keep going. Keep going. And our table of contents with everyone's contribution, contributions listed here and the moon waxing and waning and waxing and waning again. And we have with us tonight Dharmawati, Dharmawati Majid. Uh, she is based in Gorontalo, Sulawesi, Indonesia. Dharma, if you can turn your camera on, please do. Um, this is your spread. These are your pages in the book. Thank you so much. Um, or if you can't turn your camera on, please say hello. There you are, Dharma. Wonderful to see you. Hello. hello. Hello, Patma. Hello, everyone. There. Hi. Um, Dharma was, uh, has published four books and was recognized as one of Indonesia's emerging young writers at the Ubud Readers and Writers Festival in 2018. And her writing prompt came from photographer Vinay Ditajan. There you go. And uh, next, please. Also with us this evening is Luisa Igloria, who has been writing a poem a day without fail for 11 years and counting. She's currently the 20th Poet Laureate of Virginia in the United States, and she is one of Agam Agenda's frequent collaborators and contributors. And for this, we are most grateful. Her writing prompt is a photo from Oluwa Bukonola Adesanwo. Luisa, please say hello. Hi, everyone. Thank there you is. so much for this gift. Uh, it's such an honor to be part of this uh, um, collective and to be part of this beautiful book, I'm Speechless. Thank you. Thank you, Luisa. Um, Rain Chudori, is she here? Um, this is her spread. I think she's not in the room at the moment. So we'll move on to Islam Juma Kapera, my brother in Tanzania. Um, are you here, Islam? Please say hello. There he is. Um, hello, my brother. He's a Tanzanian poet, and he has also contributed to our work more than once. Um, and aside from working as a mechanic, he has been writing poetry since 1998. Islam. There he is. And he was also prompted by a photo from Vinay Ditajan. Also with us this evening, is Leopoldo Castilla, I hope I pronounced that correct, uh, from Argentina, a multi-awarded Argentinian poet with 23 books of poetry. Once upon a time, he worked as a puppeteer and journalist and traveled across five continents. His poem was prompted by a photograph by Beatriz Velarde from Peru. Uh, good evening, Leopoldo. Thank you so much for being here. There he is. Good evening. Thank you. It's so good to see you. 
also with us, I, I am not sure if Enrique Pezzo is here, one of the photographers who confirmed that he would come. Uh, he's not, so we'll keep moving. Um, we also have with us Abby Nabiha Shahab from Jakarta, Indonesia. She's calling in from her phone, so I'm not sure she can turn her video on. on. Hey! Hi, thank you. Thank you, it's brilliant. I'm really touched. Um, congratulations, everyone. Thank you, Abby. It's so great to see you. And here are your pages, your first glimpse of them. Soon we'll find a way for everybody to see the full book. Next also is Dr. Sweta Ram, a young mother, writer, and pediatrician who loves being among trees in Kerala, India, and she wrote in response to a photo by Nyancho Nwanri. Sweta, I see your smiling face. Say hello. Hi, Patma. I'm so happy to meet you all, and I'm so glad to be part of this group. Thank you. Thank you, Sweta. And joining us from Kathmandu, Nepal, is Prima Tuladhar. She's a journalist in print, television, and radio, and has participated in several other collaborative works with us. Her photo prompt was also by Holanda Caballero Mafla. Hi, Prati. Hello. Um, I'm so honored to be here. It's um, I'm overwhelmed, um, and I really want to thank uh, Ravi, my teacher um, at ACFJ, because of whom I get to be here, and to Padma, and uh, so wonderful to meet the rest of you. Thank you. Thanks, Prati. We're also joined from Pampanga by Dr. Joey Tabula, who is trained in internal medicine and writes poetry in Filipino. He also responded to a photo by Vinay Tita Jan. Um, Dr. Tabula, Jyoti, say hello. Good evening, everyone. Congratulations to everyone. And good evening from the Philippines. Hi, Doc Jyoti. Okay, and this is the photo um, that Tom Wang responded to. Tom is a journalist, a teacher, an activist, and a dreamer from Shanxi, the birthplace of Chinese civilization. And he's with us as well here tonight. He wrote a beautiful story in Chinese. Tom, say hello. Hi, good evening, everybody. Um, it's great to have something in Chinese in this book. Thank you so much for including my piece. And it's just so... Uh, ironic in many ways that today, even right now, 20 coal miners are being rescued in my hometown. And this is um, pretty much for them too and their families. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Uh, we hope they're all going to be rescued and that they will be okay. And with us this evening, I hope we caught Edwin Madrid, in the precious 30 minutes that he said he could share with us, um, are you still here with us? Uh, Edwin Madrid is a multi-awarded poet, editor, and essayist from Ecuador. He directs in Quito the publishing house Ediciones de la Linea Imaginaria. Is he still here? Okay, he had to go. I'm sorry about that. Um, also with us this evening is uh, Andy Jarvis, who is a scientist and is the Associate Director General of the Inter International Center for Tropical Agriculture based in Cali, Colombia. His work has focused on climate change, agriculture, and food security, and he works a lot with big data. Um, he wrote in response to a photo by Flor Ruiz. Andy, uh, you're here. Can you say hello briefly? Morning, everyone. Afternoon, evening, wherever you are in the world. Thanks a lot for, for inviting me. This a pleasure. Pleasure to be involved. Different, different scene for me. 
a very different scene. Andy usually writes in dense academic language, with which few of us would understand, but not in this book. Thank you so much. Um, all right, and this is the photo by Vinaydita John that Rebecca Solnit responded to. I think she needs no introduction. Um, was she able to join us uh, this evening? Red, is she here? No, okay. So I'm sure she sends her love and I can't wait for you all to read her potent, potent afterward for all the work that we put together, each one of us. All right, friends, thank you so much for bringing your stories, poetry, images, and energy into the pages of this book. With us also this evening is our co-publisher for the Philippine edition, Andrea Pachon Flores of Mil Flores Publishing. Hi, Andrea. Hi, hi, Padma. Good evening, everybody from Manila. Good evening, storytellers, poets, lovers of stories and poems. I'd like to congratulate you all on a wonderful book while thanking you all, especially the Institute for Climate and Sustainable Cities, for making Mil Flores part of this project. Harvest Moon, as you know, doesn't come once way all the time, and we do feel lucky to be part of this project. Um, with ICSC and AGAM determined to make a bold statement to make this beautiful book accessible to as many people as possible without compromising on its quality, so Flores hopes to help ICSC bring Harvest Moon to as many readers as possible, as it deserves to be read by many. So with this responsibility, already we have made Harvest Moon Available for pre-orders on our website. That's on milfloresspublishing.com. When the copies are in, we'll be putting them on sale on online shopping platforms. They're also currently in talks to make it available in a large books in a major bookstore chain. We're also making it available to independent booksellers all around the Philippines. The next year, together with ICSC, we'll be having our media launch to spread the word and of this important title. We also hope to work with the regional distributor to make the book available in the ASEAN region. That's also as part of the Mill Flores catalog, it will, it will also go out to our network of publishers whom we hope will find interest in a book such as this. Please accept my congratulations as well as my greetings for a safe and blessed holiday. My congratulations goes especially to Red Padma and Teresa who in the last leg of publishing this book um, showed a lot of the devotion and, and I know that you'll keep working hard to bring this title to as many readers as possible. So thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Adria. And Julia or Carissa will drop the links to the site where you can pre-order the book. And now I'd like to invite my beloved co-editor and our lead for Latin America to share her own story of the book. Alexandra Walter lives on her farm near Cali in Colombia. She loves to dance. She founded the poetry group La Pacha Mama, whose slogan is Drop the Gun, Raise a Poem. I love that. Professionally, she works as a writer, editor, and translator. She's a passionate master storyteller, as you'll soon hear, and she has brought so much magic and wonder to the book. Alex? Thank you, Padma, for that introduction. And I want to say hello to all of you from the mountains of Colombia. A big, big hug to everybody. I would like to start by quoting the very last sentence in the book that says, to the forces that helped deliver this book who remain hidden from view, we extend a deep bow of gratitude. First, my gratitude for this opportunity of meeting such wonderful persons, the authors, the photographers, the whole Agam group is a fabulous group. Even those I have not yet met personally like Tom Cruise, my sincere gratitude. And second, I want to highlight my amazement at the magical threads that have woven this book together. It's unbelievable. Right from the start, from my involvement in the project, <clears throat> when somebody mentioned my name, 
to Padma on the other side of the planet. She called, we spoke for an hour. That was about three years ago and we haven't stopped talking since then. My first assignment was to find photographers from Latin America. I did not know a single one, not even the local ones, but I asked Mr. Google to give me the name of the 10 best photographers of each country in Latin America. I went to their websites, sent them emails, and to my surprise, 18 of them responded with 60 very good candidate photographs. With that treasure, uh, we went, I traveled to, to Philippines where the editorial team met for the first time. There was the poet Ramon Sunico, a man with the best taste for literature, Rejana Rosso, a pressure cooker of ideas bursting out continuously, Padma, who to me is like a beautiful bamboo plant, flexible but unbreakable, and Red, who to me is the Asian version of a Viking, adventurous, intelligent, and undaunted. And the dictionary says that undaunted means not intimidated or discouraged by difficulty. That's what you are, Red, and that's why this book is happening. The photos were the spark that would ignite the contributors to write, but the authors knew nothing about these photographs. For example, Irma Pineda from Mexico received a photo taken by Maria Faciolinsi of an indigenous woman from the Wajú community in Colombia. This community has undergone severe malnutrition and between 2010 and 2015, 5,000 of their children died of hunger. These children died without shedding a tear because due to their degree of dehydration. But Irma knew nothing about this. And yet her poem starts by saying, my body is fractured like the thirsty earth all moistness gone with the tears that now feed rivers in other lands. Is that not serendipity or magic? The team got together again a year later in Istanbul. Here we selected the texts that would structure our harvest moon. And these works were so beautiful, so wonderfully written, so appropriate for the theme that we were looking for that it took a lot of courage and inner strength. And of course, a lot of wine for the spirit in order to read them, but we managed. And very much like the stanza that Edwin Madrid poem has and says, tackling all battles with the hope of returning triumphant, those who dared conquer the heart's borders, those who founded a city in the thoughts of others. Then back in Colombia, I had the great pleasure of meeting Leonardo Padura. He had been invited to come to Cali, my hometown, for the launch of one of his latest books. And I was far for, from dreaming even that I would be chatting and drinking coffee with one of the greatest novelists in, in the world today. But it happened. Again, serendipity or magic, I don't know. The way I see it, Harvest Moon has been possible because all the gods, all the heavens, and even all the hills allowed it to happen. The birth of this book, which we celebrate today, to me is a miracle. In a world torn by upheavals, wars, disasters, the pandemic, this piece of art is hope for all of us. I would like to end with one sentence from Margarito Cuellar's that says, Margarito Cuellar's contribution that says, we do not intend to leave. We will plant our dream once more at the water's edge. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Alex. And now I think we all would love to hear from the poets, some of the poets who have graced this book with their work. And it's my honor to introduce the poet Jose Zuleta. Um, after each poet reads, Alex will read her translation of their work. Jose Zuleta is um, from Colombia. He has won several national awards for his poetry and short stories. And he is the founder of the outstanding program Libertad Bajo Palabra, which runs creative writing workshops with prison inmates around the country. His poem was prompted by a photo from Narenda Shresta, Jose Zuleta. Uh, can we hear Jose? Buenos días. Eh, voy a leer el poema. Eh, bueno, felicitaciones por este bello proyecto. Un saludo entrañable a Alexandra Walter, que me ha convocado, y a los amigos de América Latina, Margarito Cuellar, Alvin Madrid, y también a Leopoldo Castilla, grandes poetas de América. Llueve. La biblioteca se ha inundado. No habrá en dónde guarecerse, ni saber qué pasó en otras épocas. ¿Quién taló todo? Llueve. La marea del hombre crece, anega sus dominios, como el incendio que calcina su propio combustible. Llueve. ¿Qué mirar si solo hay agua en los ojos? Agua dulce, agua salada. Llueve, los zapatos perdidos, los caminos borrados, quietas, bajo el dócil techo de plástico, sentir frío y recordar la leña seca, mirar hacia adelante, hundidas en la lluvia de sus ojos. Gracias. The library has flooded. No shelter to be found. No way, no way to know what happened in other times. Who chopped everything down? Llueve. Rain falls. Humanity's tide is rising, drowning its domains like fire consuming its own fuel. Llueve. Rain falls. What to see if there's only water in the ice? Fresh water, salt water. Llueve, rain falls. The shoes lost, the roads erased. Quiet under the docile plastic roof. Feeling the cold and remembering the dry wood. Looking ahead, sunken in the rain of their own eyes. Thank you so much, Jose and Alex, for reading. Thank you. It's so beautiful to hear the poem read in Jose's voice for the first time. We move now to Is Margarito Cuellar here? Uh, I don't see him yet. And Rocio, I think, is uh, having some technical problems at the moment. Um, Maria, could you let me know when Rocio is ready uh, to read? In the meantime, I want to share um, from Ramon Sunico in the chat, so beautiful. And from Sweta Ram in India, she said, such a beautiful poem. Thank you both. I, while we are assisting Rocio, um, who cannot hear, hear us, I think, we will proceed 
slowly. Um, everyone, before we go, can we please raise our hands to applaud our dear poets from Latin America? Thank you. And now, um, I'd like to invite my dear Rehana Rosso, co-editor and lead for Africa, to share some words and stories on the book. Rehana has worked as a journalist in South Africa for more than three decades and is now starting a farm. Her first novel, What Will People Say?, was awarded for fiction by the National Institute for Humanities and Social Sciences. And her latest book, Predator Politics, was published just last year by Hakana Media. Rehana's fierce love and determination have really given this book its backbone. Rehana. Thank you, Padma, for those kind words. Um, when I received the email from Padma and from Red, the instigation um, for the second version of a climate change book, um, I was immediately gripped. I knew I wanted to work on this project. I knew that I wanted to make this project a success. I knew that this project was so important to the entire planet. I just want to say also that I've been involved in the book publishing world for about two decades. And this is without a doubt, the most amazing collection of writers from around the world. I have never ever been in a discussion with so many writers from so many places around the world. I get, I'm getting shivers up my spine at the collection of people that we have gathered here today and the collection of people who have contributed to the book. My experience of working on the book was, it was one of the easiest projects that I have ever worked on. Um, the literature that went out asking photographers and writers to contribute um, swung everybody over in the same way that I was swung over immediately um, to, un to understanding the importance of this project. Um, so many of the writers that I had contacted to ask to contribute to the book told me initially that they were too busy, that they had deadlines looming, that their publishers were breathing down their necks and changed their minds. They changed their minds after reading the call for people to become involved in the book and said, I'm going to put aside the other work that I am doing and I am going to contribute to this book. I think the best response I got from all of the African writers was from Anki Kroch, a South African writer who said, no, she can't. Um, she has a deadline, her publishers breathing down her neck, she's working on her next book. And then 10 minutes after she read the appeal, um, said a green mist had descended across her eyes and she was completely distracted from her other deadline, which she is now setting aside um, in order to contribute to the book. What I found amazing about the contributions from the African writers is that <clears throat> their writing was talking about the crisis we currently face, um, the droughts, the rainstorms, the changes in climate patterns. And there were so many appeals from so many of the writers to God to rescue us. And it wasn't only the Christian God, it was the God of the lakes, the God of the rivers, the gods of the mountains, asking them, we know, or telling them, we know that we have angered you and we will be finding a way to sort this problem out soon. I was also struck last month by an article in the Guardian newspaper, and I suggest that all of you read it. Um, it's by Ben Okri, a brilliant writer, who says that artists must confront the climate crisis. We must write as if they are, these are the last days on earth. And I looked at that and I said, we've done it already. Um, we've just postponed the launch of that book because of climate change. Um, I felt like writing to Ben Okri and saying, you know, you need to get involved with Agam's work. You need to salute Agam's work as well. We've done the book. Um, I think the book still deals a lot with the looming crisis. I think the challenge for writers across the world 
is to look at what the next steps are. What are we going to do? We understand the crisis now. Now we need to look at mitigation. We need to look at what we're going to do as global, as a global community to sort out the problem of climate change. I salute all of our writers. I thank you from the bottom of my heart. Um, all of your contributions are stunning. Um, again, I feel as though I've been very privileged to be part of this program. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Rehana. And in my excitement to move forward, I have um, mistakenly skipped over um, Margit Margarito Cuellar, who is going to read to us from his poem, Morning Voices. Um, thank you for correcting me and pointing the error out to me. I'm sorry, I didn't see you uh, earlier. So Margarito is a multi-awarded poet of Mexico. He has published 19 collections of poetry and an excerpt of the poem he's reading tonight was part of multimedia artist Jenny Holzer's artwork, Hurt Earth, which was a large scale light projection mounted on the Tate Modern in London and in various locations in Glasgow coinciding with COP26 um, to highlight words and voices from climate vulnerable countries. And tonight, Margarito is reading to us from his contribution to Harvest Moon, which was prompted by this photo from Vinay Dito Jan. Good evening, Margarita. Good morning. And good Un morning. fragmento de <coughs> el texto que forma parte del libro. Voz 7. Me han dicho que los osos polares comen delfines, que el zumbido de las abejas se apaga, que el tardígrado sobrevive al vacío del espacio estelar y permanece en estado de inanición como si fuera una momia en miniatura o un froto seco. Les revelaré un secreto. Cuando no hay nada que decir con palabras o que dibujar con trazos, mantengo la mente en blanco hasta que las formas ocultas se revelan. 8. Sigo las señales de una estela de luz. Creo distinguir entre la niebla huellas semejantes a las mías. El eco de las montañas me devuelve los cantos de seres extraviados como yo. Más allá de los desiertos fluye el agua por las venas y los músculos de la tierra, la voz de las piedras y las criaturas vivientes. Sin todo esto, los árboles serían enanos verdes y los humanos y las bestias, a lo mucho, aves disecadas o juguetería. 9. Cada vez más cerca los faros errantes de los cocuyos. 10. No nos pensamos ir, fundaremos otra vez nuestro sueño a la orilla del agua. Thank you very much. Voice seven of morning songs. I have been told that polar bears eat dolphins, that the buzzing of bees is shutting down, that tardigrades survive in the vacuum of outer space and remain in a state of suspended animation as if they were mummies or dried fruit. I will reveal a secret to you. When I have nothing to put into words or to draw into lines, I keep my mind blank until hidden forces reveal themselves. Voice eight. I follow the signals of a glimmer of light Amidst the fog, I think I can distinguish footprints similar to mine. The echo of the mountain brings back to me the chanting of beings as lost as I am. Water flows beyond the deserts through the earth's veins and muscles, the voice of rocks and living creatures. Without all this, trees would be green dwarfs and humans 
and beasts, at best, dissected birds or toys. Voice nine, increasingly closer, the drifting lighthouses of fireflies. Voice 10, we do not intend to leave. We will plant our dream once more at the water's edge. Beautiful, thank you Margarito and Alex. Thank you so much, hands in the air everybody. <laughs> And I think Rocio has been able to log in now um, and is connected. So we will be able to hear from Rocio Cardoso. I hope everything is okay now. Rocio is a distinguished poet of Uruguay. She has garnered awards for the children's stories that she writes and is widely recognized as a defender of women's rights. She wrote her poem in response to a photo by Hector Gonzalez de Cunco. Rocio, please. Eh, buenos días, buenos días, ¿qué tal? ¿Me escuchan? Sí, Rocío, te escuchamos. Bien, bueno, muchas gracias por la invitación, pero eh, veo que en el libro salí que soy de Cuba, soy de Uruguay. Oh. Me parece que hubo un error ahí. Pero bueno, agradezco de todas formas a la organización eh, la oportunidad que me dan de estar en esta interesante antología. Es para mí realmente un placer. Y agradezco mucho a Alexandra Walter porque es una gran amiga y y ha hecho todo el trámite para que yo pudiera estar allí y hoy. Voy a leer los poemas. Atravesaron el tiempo, vuelve desde, volviendo desde las sombras, son alfareros de esperanza, el desamor ya no los persigue como antes, llegan con la serenidad de los ríos que se alargan y no terminan, asombrados por los ponientes, ajenos escuchan otra vez el canto de los pájaros vienen del ayer de un pasado olvidado con largas cadenas corroídas de misterio cierran una época remota en todos los rincones del planeta para no ser más entre miles de seres invisibles con calor en sus vientres sangre y alimento Llegan con aroma flores exiliadas. Son hombres que regresan despojados de antiguos rostros. Sepultaron sus máscaras, abriendo sus áridos ojos, crucificados en raicillas nuevas. En esa intemperie sin patria se eleva un sol propio. Allí... Vivirán sus sueños descifrando el secreto que estremece las piedras. Todo quedará atrás. Será una nueva creación con voz clara canta, una melodía que se alarga y no termina. Es el misterio de la vida que llega en una civilización nueva. Su canto es un tropel asomado al nuevo mundo por venir. Muchas gracias. Uncertain sea without horizons. Traversing time, they return from the shadows. Potters of hope, lost loves no longer chase them. They arrive peaceful to the rivers that stretch out and do not end. Bewildered by alien dawns, they again hear the song of the birds. They come from yesterday, from a forgotten past, with long chains corroded by mystery. They close a remote epoch everywhere on the planet to be one more among thousands of invisible beings. With warmth in their bellies, blood and food come with the aroma of exiled flowers. They are men who returned, deprived of old faces. 
they buried their masks, opening their barren eyes, flourishing into new rootlets. In the homeless outdoors, their own sun rises. There, they will live with dreams, deciphering the secret that shatters the stones. Everything will be left behind. It will be a new creation. They sing with a clear voice. A melody runs on and on and does not end. It is the mystery of life arriving in a new civilization. Their song is a multitude looking out at the new world to come. Thank you so much, Alex. And I would like to reassure Rocio that in the book itself, we made that correction. And yes, she is acknowledged as being a poet of Uruguay and not Cuba. We made sure that that was corrected. Thank you so much, Rocio. Your voice is so beautiful. And thank you also to Alex. Yes, Ravi, we averted war. Now let's hear from Sifiwe Mlovu. She is a Zimbabwean writer, scholar, and filmmaker who has been awarded for her works in fiction, film, and academic writing. Her writing prompt was a photo by Dylan Molala. Hi, Sifiwe. Hello. Um, hi, Pana. Hi, Rihanna. Uh, I hope everyone can hear me. Um, I'll be reading from What Becomes of the Broken Hearted. Um, so here we go. So what becomes, so, sorry, give me a moment. Okay. So this is what becomes of the broken hearted, I think, as she uses an attachment on her Swiss army knife-like nail cutter to remove the thin layer of dirt that is trapped under my fingernails. She does not know as she does this, that she is taking away from me a part of myself that I hold very dear. As she scrapes, scrapes, scrapes away, she does not know that the many years of comfort that I have found in that blackish brown layer that is like the surface of something. How can she know what I know, feel what I feel when she has not seen what I have seen? As long as she has ever known, the land has always sprouted these barely habitable, matchstick concrete structures with corrugated roofs. She lovingly calls the settlement home. I think it is a sadness, as something that should not have been, but I call it home as well. It was home long before they came, when the land was verdant, plentiful, and ours, just his and mine, mine and his. A small holding where I could, I could sink my hand into the red earth, plant to seed and watch it grow like the promise of the future. This was before the sun had suddenly become unbearable and cracked the earth. Lines were drawn deep and intersecting, creating a puzzle of the land that I had always known and loved. Refusing to read the signs, we had persevered. The first year broke our hearts, sorry, the first year broke our backs, the second year broke our hearts, the third year broke our spirits. When the men from the council descended upon us, it was obvious that they, like vultures, had been watching from a distance, waiting for our weakest moment. Thank you very much. And thank you so much for allowing me to be a part of this. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sipiwe. And that is from a short story, one of many potent short stories in the book. And next to read for us is Yuvan Aves, a naturalist, teacher, and activist in Chennai, India. In his essay, Harvest Moon, Yuvan writes about the Vedantangal bird sanctuary, which came under threat of being drastically reduced in size last year. Yesterday, he received news that the government withdrew this proposal after a long youth-led campaign that integrated art and activism. Congratulations, Yuvan, to you and your colleagues and friends. His piece was prompted by a photo as well from Holanda Caballero Mafla. Yuvan? Thank you, Padma. 
um, and uh, really thrilled to be here uh, in this community. My piece is really about how hydrologies shape uh, places and people and uh, uh, a forgetting of that, what it can lead to. Um, so a, a little excerpt from that. Um, today we witness real estate and roadways marching and branching in these districts. Rainbow homes, paradise villas, boards which have cropped up newly around the farm. Lakes are being gagged by concrete, sealing off the mouths of underground reservoirs, whipped from behind by far-off entities, utterly disconnected from the places and people within the purview of their power. For the past three years, Chennai has been facing a strange and sad irony during the rainy season. Flooding is followed by acute water scarcity. Water deluges and then runs off, unable to find the space it had once filled. During the summer of 2019, in the city and its surroundings, tap water ran for precious two hours a day. All the bow wells had run dry. Many urban planning experts assert now the need to revisit and relearn Nir Nyanam, or water wisdom, that existed in these regions, once and rightly treated as indispensable for living. In Tamil, Jnanam also means intelligence or perception or a deep sense. Nir Jnanam, water wisdom or a deep sense of water. Landscape merges with mindscape. The lake edge is a liminal place of land, water, life and more. It is a portal in a sense to a similar space within. Buns, scrublands, broom grass and the palm lines gild the realms of my imagination and are often the setting of my dreams. They are indelibly prop rooted to my reality in complex continuum. At the crack of dawn, I followed a night jazz call and came upon a powerful scene at the water's edge. Worker termites, millions of them, were carrying pieces of vetiver grass back to their nest. The grasses had begun to rot as the water levels rose. Long files scurried, branched off, and rejoined in two way traffic through the dense undergrowth. Their movement had cleaved faint paths on the mud. I gradually became aware of a large patch of ground crackling percussively. As I crouched down, the faint trembling rose through my knees. The large soldier termites were standing guard on either side of the foraging lines, banging their chins on dry leaves and brandishing their mandibles. Thousands of them, like they were sounding their tribal drums, announcing to the surroundings their activity. As they made trunk trails and slipped into their mound, aerating the soil, they were shaping the land and were always a beneficial geological force. Thank you. Thank you so much, Yuvan. Look at Rehana. <laughs> Thank you. And next to read for us is Delal Arya who was born in Istanbul, Turkey, and grew up on board ships with her father, who was a captain. And beautiful photo by Vina Idita John. Hello, Dalal. Hello, Padma. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you, Padma, for this introduction. It was uh, really a magical, it was really magical to be part of this international anthology about climate change. Um, and the photograph I received was also full of inspirations. Um, my piece is Algae House. Um, they say the Algae House is the only place to escape ex extinction. One says the house isn't submerged because it was built on a sacred water source while the other claims that the gods underground were asleep and their slumber protects us from the flood. At dawn, my father and brother ride boats from the pier beyond our most covered garden, paddling to the estuary where the flooded ruins of the old world lie. They dive under the sea to scavenge our old world items. Often my dad brings something just to make us happy. 
Once he found old clothes in a submerged house he dove into, and my mother sewed some of them for me and uh, my four sisters. These were caftans made of silk from the lost cities of exotic people. They were hundreds of years old. We wear these clothes, we bra braid each other's hair and dance with peacock feathers in our hands, imagining that we are secret goddesses. Sometimes I go down to the bottom of the house and stand waist deep in the water. I put my head in and look underwater. In the abandoned warm darkness of the water, I see a room lined with bookshelves and furniture, chandeliers hanging from the ceiling and carpets floating. Far away, figurines, curtains, and shattered vases drift through the kelp forest in magical waves. While I am waiting with my head in the water, I sometimes hear heavy furniture, maybe a stove or a wardrobe hit the bottom. Things are landing in their new places. I am gazing into the darkness and imagining that even after most of the world is destroyed, something is still falling slowly through the dark. No, the gods are not sleeping here as the elderly say. They are slowly decaying on their long journey down. When they hit the pitch dark bottom, only their bones covered in moss will remain. In the future, we will be the gods and goddesses whose stories are told. Thank you. Thank you, Delal. I love that line about in the future being the gods and goddesses whose stories are told. Thank you so much. And now we will hear from Marjorie Evasco, a multi-awarded poet of the Philippines and a beloved mentor to many, 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 many writers. As a teacher of literature and creative writing, she has made it her mission to encourage young poets to attend to the more than human in their work. She was also one of the contributors to our first book, Agam, Filipino Narratives on Uncertainty and Climate Change. And her poem is the umbilical cord that connects Harvest Moon to its predecessor. Greetings, friends. I'm happy to celebrate with you the birthing of the beautiful Harvest Moon book with a reading of my poem, Farol de Combate. It begins with an epigraph from Ilya Kaminsky's poem, Praise. This is how it goes. This is how, while darkness drew my profile with its finger, I have learned to see past as Montale saw it, the obscure thoughts of God descending among a child's drumbeats over you, over me, over the lemon trees. Farol de Combate. One. The rain falls lighter now, and I gaze at the dark descended unto our town. From this mountain shelter, I saw the old mango tree struck down by fierce lightning from the east, thunder rumbling in the heart of the guardian of the land, who thrills to the meeting of the drought's last sigh with rush of rain brought by the northerlies this ninth month of my return to my language. Two, I will go home to my people, bringing fruits from hills I had planted to marvelous trees I had met on my travels in other lands on this revolving earth. Fragrant pears, their fresh, flushed cheeks, bright lemons, yellow and thirst quenching in hot season. I will go across the town's old cemetery where my ancestors sleep in edgeless night. I will not wake them in their supreme repose. I am transient like them, simply passing through. Three, 
I trust that beside the well which had been dug by my elders, a storm lamp had been placed, lighting up the path towards home, the lamp lighter, minding the first law of neighborliness. To help one another as best as one can in daily acts of living. For if the lamp were put out unlit, someone passing might stumble or slide, fall into the neighborhood well and die. When I pass by the well, I will draw water and drink. Give thanks to my unseen neighbor for the light. Congratulations, everyone. Large for that, and thank you to all of our speakers so far. Um, this is Carissa of the Agam Agenda team. Uh, on behalf of everyone in the Agam Agenda, I just want to come in and say thank you for being here again, uh, for reading such enchanting poetry, prose, and sharing such incredible imagery for today. I also wanted to thank those who are joining us uh, via live stream on Facebook. Thank you again for joining us. Uh, know that this is just the beginning of our Harvest Moon activity, so please stay connected with us. We're all over on social media, so be updated on the latest forthcoming events uh, leading up to the new year. Uh, as a dynamic shape-shifting platform in the intersections in the humanities and arts and sciences, the Agam Agenda works year-round in creating and widening storytelling circles on climate change. One of the initiatives which Agam launched this year is When Is Now? Seeding Climate Action Through the Arts. It's a global campaign linking poetry and art across the world, collectively asking and demanding the now we need for our planet. In partnership with the Climate Vulnerable Forum, we invite you all to continue joining us in this global poetry rebellion. So you can just go to whenisnow.org to write your own response to a poem. Again, that's whenisnow.org, and we will leave that both in the Zoom chat and the Facebook live stream chat as well. Now, to continue with the program, it's my pleasure to introduce the next speaker, Malebo Sefodi one of our contributors both for Harvest Moon and for When Is Now. In Harvest Moon, uh, Malebo wrote the piece, What We Lost in the Floods, to the photo prompt by Nyancho Nwanri from Nigeria. And today she will be reading the poem she wrote for When Is Now. Malebo is an interdisciplinary scholar, artist, and a South African feminist writer. She is the author of the award-winning nonfiction title, Misbehave, published by Blackbird Books. We also have an upcoming podcast episode with Malebo, uh, which will be out by next week. It's a very powerful conversation you can look forward to. But for now, Malebo, please take it away. I'm getting so emotional. <sighs> I'm sorry. Um, thank you so much. Um, hello, everyone. Um, all gratitude for being here. Gyaleboha, Dumelang, um, Rihanna, it's so great to see you. Thank you so much for opening me in, for bringing me in and introducing me to this project. Um, Agam has meant so much to me. I'm a nonfiction writer. And um, Agam has stretched my creative bands. Um, this, I contributed a fiction piece in the Harvest Moon. And um, when Padma um, told me about when is now, um, I had never written poetry in my life. And this was my first poem. And um, it is, I have been gifted so much uh, by this project and it's really, really amazing to see everybody, to be with everyone here. I am going to read for my poem, uh, the contribution that I made to Win is Now. Native nostalgia, 
a, pre a prelude to the now. When will we ever feel safe in the mother city's nest? Neng, ni, ni. I long for a time when harmony between humans and nature was not a utopian dream scattered by the patter of raindrops that threaten rooftops. The, the rain that is no longer euphony or lullaby to hush you to slumber. A storm is fast approaching. Stay on higher ground, dig up trenches and unclog the drains. Wailing voices choking within the mother city, echo code red, declare this a national emergency. Belligerent tempest warn of a time to come. A treaty between the mortals and the natural environment is needed. Displaced, confused, we've become strangers to the mother city. Are you going to listen to the wind or are you going to wait for floating lilies to deliver seeds of condolences? Thank you very much. Malebo, thank you so much. And thank you for being such a loving, giving collaborator of the Agam Agenda and for trusting us with your work. Thank you. Now let's hear from someone who represents the reason we do what we do, the reason we work for kinder futures, and the reason we continue to hope, the next generation. Pilar Medina is an accomplished 17-year-old artist, songwriter, and leader. She began volunteering for the Agam Agenda during the pandemic and has organized talks and workshops on climate action in her school. She is the very first young reader of Harvest Moon. Pilar, we can't wait to hear from you. It's such an honor to share a room with all of you here today. I couldn't be more grateful than I am now since I have the opportunity to speak here at the long-awaited book launch for such an incredible anthology. I truly believe that this book is going to help change the world and I'm so grateful for the fact that I, even in the most minute way, have contributed to this project and watched it blossom into what it is now. So um, Padma asked me to share my thoughts on the book here today. And what I'm about to read to you is an excerpt of a review I wrote for the book that talks about people like me who are young adults and how we view the book and what it represents in a day and age where our part in fighting the climate crisis is incredibly important. I and a lot of other people at the ripe old age of 12 to 17 don't really appreciate being told outright that we are obligated to do something. This is especially true when we're asked to work on something we are not emotionally invested in. Most of the time, it can be small and mundane things like finishing the essay you've neglected, neglect, neglected to work on for two weeks or housework that feels pretty gross too, like cleaning the bathroom floor. I, I used to feel that this was a small and contemporary issue, but I slowly started to realize while reading this book that this is a fundamental flaw of ours when it comes to our involvement with global issues. People are told over and over again, from kindergarten to grade 12, that they need to be active in their communities and involved with different groups to tackle issues like climate change. And yet, we're always left with the lingering question of, why should I? When it comes to climate change, that question can be always be answered in the classroom using the scientific perspective. The issue is a threat to many ecosystems across the globe, and the change in climate makes the weather violent and relentless. Students have been told that in their science classes for years, and that's the extent of which the issue has been touched upon in our classroom environment. So while we've had our question answered, we still haven't found the answer to our emotional, our answer to the emotional side of our inquiry. Why should I care? Some students will start to feel emotionally compelled to act knowing the ecological and meteorological effect of climate change, but others need to be shown in a unique way how the, issue goes far beyond, how the issue goes far beyond the effects mentioned in their science classes. Stories in the poems in Harvest Moon, whether directly or indirectly, ask the readers to reflect on how they live, where they live, and on what they plan to do moving forward after reading their narratives. There were moments in the book where I was halfway through reading a piece when I would be stopped by something an author had said that caused me to sit and think for a while. One specific moment I remember while reading the original manuscript was when I got to read a story called Because Your Body is a Border. I started to think about one specific line I read. 
There is a world untouched by everything that has happened here. And that line came after how the author Rain described their home country when it was devastated by a massive drought. That line made me think about my own home country where the rain can go on for weeks and weeks and how it compares to theirs where rain has forgotten to come. Two polar opposite effects and issues brought about by climate change. This is also contextualized by earlier poems in the book like Rain, Falls, and Desert that discuss the same issues and how they occur in other countries. The anthology themes of loss and seeking hope unify the writers and their stories. And the book allows the readers themselves to find small connections like the ones I found when reading the poems I mentioned above. And finding those connections was one of the most important things the book has done for me as a young reader. The book never tells, its, tells it to the reader straight. When I read the poems, I didn't feel intimidated by who the authors were, and I didn't feel despair because of the subject matter. The book reimagines the climate conversation, and it feels like I'm having a conversation with the authors about the climate. And that's a powerful trait that the book has. And I hope that other readers, young or old, will see the same connections that I did and feel moved to carry the conversation on with others. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pilar. And it's really fitting that we are closing this launch with your words. Harvest Moon is for you and for all the young dreamers and fighters acting out of love for this planet and working for better tomorrows. Harvest Moon, Poems and Stories from the Edge of the Climate Crisis is an offering laid with love at the altar of all that we have lost and all that can still be gained. While we're here, I want to acknowledge that we've also been joined by our good friend Vijay Villafranca, photographer, who contributed two stunning photos that complete the book. Hello, Vijay. Thank you for making time to join us, even if you're out of town. And also with us tonight are Susan Lara and Grace Monte de Ramos, who helped us bring this book to press in its final stages. Nazrin De Castro, my colleague, is also here, and she will be helping us push the When Is Now campaign in Indonesia and with the Climate Reality Project. Daniel Mittler, a longtime supporter of Agam's agenda, is here also. And Celine, who was with us at the very, very beginning of creating this book, our dear colleague, Celine. And uh, that, um, sorry, Farah Manuel Nolasco, of course, is also here. And the beautiful moons that you see with us and that appear throughout the book were her creations, as well as our octopus, whom we call Octavia. Thank you all uh, for being here with us tonight. And dear writers, artists, makers, and friends, this is just the beginning. Our moon is rising. We invite you to work with us to get our book published and read in your regions and in your languages. Please join us for future book events or reach out to us if you would like to organize a Harvest Moon event in your communities. We would like to honor and amplify each of your voices in the coming months. It's too bad we don't have time to hear every single person in this gathering tonight, although I'm sure we would love to. But please join us for future events so we can hear you as well. We also invite you to be part of When Is Now, where you may embrace the lines of another poet with your own verse. Luisa y Gloria very generously uh, is part of When Is Now also. And if there is one thing I'm certain we can accomplish together, it is to create a surge of compassion, solidarity, and radical kindness through art. We'll see each other again. There's much to be done. Thank you so much, everyone. Our love to you. Stay strong. Bravo, Padma in red. Bravo. Thank you, Padma. Thank you, Red. Thank you, Padma. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Thank Red. You.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, all the writers. Thank you, all the photographers. Thank you, all the poets. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. Yes. Thank you so much for everything that you brought to the book. I have the same big hug and big thank yous to everybody. Thank you, Shirley Campbell, for joining us today. Oh, Shirley is here. Thank you so much for joining us. Muchas gracias. Bello trabajo. Estoy muy conmovido. Adiós. Adiós, Pepe, lindo. Muchísimas gracias. Quiero agradecer eh, en especial a Ale Alexandra eh, por la lectura de mis poemas y, y me encantó escuchar a todos estos nuevos poetas que no tenía el gusto y el placer de conocer. Y también quiero agradecer a Padma Pérez eh, por su locución. Me parece que fue muy muy buena intervención. Así que muy felices fiestas para todos y un mejor año eh, 2022. Cariños desde Uruguay. Terima kasih, Dharma. Sama-sama, Padma. Terima kasih, Red. Terima kasih. Terima kasih Rehana, senang sekali. Nice to know you. Nice to know you too. Any shout out Tom Cruiser? Tom! He can see you, sir. Speech, speech, speech. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how to unmute still. <laughs> oh, you just did it. <laughs> Nice to meet you, Tom Cruise. Beautiful work, everybody. Just, I'm exploding with love for the whole thing.